In the realm of the unexplained, we find enduring enigmas that defy all rational understanding. It's a place where logic falters and the unknown triumphs. Number 10. The story of the Swedish twin sisters Sabina and Ursula Eriksson is one of the most bizarre true crime stories in history. The sisters were born on the 3rd of November in 1967 in Varmland. The sisters had no history of mental health issues or any convictions. In 2000s, the sisters split ways, with Ursula moving to the United States and Sabina heading to Ireland, where she would reside with her spouse and their two children. On the 16th of May in 2008, though, the two sisters would gain notoriety when Ursula visited Sabina. It's uncertain why, but they departed Sabina's home secretly and traveled by ferry to Liverpool. Once they were there, they headed to a nearby police station and apparently reported safety concerns for Sabina's children. The Liverpool police then contacted Dublin to follow up on this and learned that the woman and her partner had fought the night prior. At 11.30 that morning, the pair got onto a National Express coach that was en route to London. They were behaving normally until they exited the bus on the M6 motorway, where their mysterious journey would soon begin. As soon as they stepped off the bus, Sabina and Ursula began to exhibit some pretty odd behavior. This behavior made the driver reluctant to let them back on. A little while later, they were seen on the central reservation on the motorway, where they attracted so much attention that officers were sent to intervene. The traffic police arrived to assist them, but they decided to run across a very busy road, which was filmed by a local news crew. Ursula managed to cross the road, but not without some serious injuries. Sabina, on the other hand, had been knocked over, rendering her unconscious. Ursula found herself being restrained by one of the officers, to whom she shouted, I recognize you, I know you're not real. When Sabina came to, though, she refused any medical attention and attacked an officer who was trying to help her. For this reason, she was sedated and arrested. Sabina was then processed by police in Stoke on Trent, and after calming down, she would be released from custody. But this was not the end of the strange journey. Sabina ended up meeting and chatting with the man who was walking his dog. It was 54-year-old Glenn Hollinsad. She asked him if he knew a place where she could stay, and he promptly invited her back to his home. This, unfortunately, was the worst mistake that Glenn could have made. The very next day, he came staggering from his home, shouting that he'd been struck with a blade. Unfortunately, he couldn't be stabilized and succumbed to his wounds. Sabina was subsequently arrested and convicted of manslaughter with diminished responsibility. The defense trial claimed that Sabina was insane at the time of the homicide, but recovered by the time of the trial. The council ruled that she was a secondary sufferer of Philia Du, with her sister being the primary sufferer. The entire ordeal was ruled as a shared psychosis. Number 9. In 1993, James Jim Haisung Jr was living in Sylvania Township, Ohio. The 20-year-old was recognized as an accomplished pilot who attended the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Unfortunately though, he didn't meet the requirements for graduation, but he did get some flying experience. He began his flying journey out of the Toledo Suburban Airport in January. On the 15th of March in 1993, the pilot was seen at 10.15 a.m climbing into a two-seat 1993 Piper Cherokee Arrow with the tail number N15206 that he'd rented at the Toledo Suburban Airport. He was planning to make a short trip to Jackson, Michigan, where he was supposed to take an exam before becoming a flight instructor. But James didn't have a flight plan for this trip. The journey should have only taken about 20 minutes, but the Federal Aviation Administration air logs revealed something else. After climbing to 4,800 feet, James passed the Jackson Airport several miles southeast. The plane pushed on past Grand Rapids and Grand Haven, Michigan, until it was lost over Lake Michigan a whole hour after takeoff. The plane disappeared from the tracker, and so did James. The incident presented itself like an accidental crash, but no wreckage or plane debris belonging to the Piper Cherokee Arrow was ever found. James's fate also remains unknown, with only theories popping up to explain it all. Some believe that the plane accidentally crashed into the lake, where it remains to this day. 
But this theory was unsupported by the sonar imagery and extensive searches that were carried out on the lake. Others suggested that the missing man had stolen the plane with the intention of selling it. Connecting to this idea is the theory that he met with foul play after trying to sell the plane to the wrong crowd. The aircraft has since been listed as stolen in the FAA database, but mysteriously, on four different occasions, pilots around the country have been reported to be using the tail number of the missing plane during radio weather checks or fuel purchases. There's no evidence confirming that anyone saw the aircraft with this tail number, though. It's said to be worth $40,000 and the owner was compensated for the loss. Information about this man or the plane associated with him should be directed to the Monroe County Sheriff's Office at 740-472-1612. Number 8. Chicago's Columbian Exposition of 1893 has been a point of interest for many. It was popularized in Eric Larson's Devil in the White City novel, a tale based on homicides that occurred nearby. The most intriguing aspect of this exposition, though, is the Lost Liberty Bell. It was a replica of the Philadelphia Bell artifact and was made by the Menili Bell Foundry of Troy. The Liberty Bell, though, was much larger, weighing around 13,000 pounds. In 1893, it was displayed at the Chicago World's Fair. The daughters of the American Revolution founder, Mary Desha, and Pennsylvania member Minnie Mickley represented DAR on the Columbian Liberty Bell Committee. They also helped facilitate its sponsors. Members of the DAR were encouraged to donate metal objects of importance to be melted down and forged into the bell. The community had some pretty big plans for this incredible artifact. It was set to tour the world. Its travels began in Illinois, where it was sent to various towns before being sent across the state border. It would later sit at the International and Cotton States Exposition in Atlanta, Georgia. The bell would then be tracked to Mexico, where it toured for a short while, before heading over to England, and this is where the trail gets cold. There were plans for a permanent home for the bell when it concluded its world tour, but the artifact would never make it there. According to an article in the Daughters of American Revolution magazine, the bell was in Russia in 1905, where it would be held awaiting tariff payments. When the Bolshevik Revolution started in 1917, Russia still had the bell in its possession. Apparently, during this time, the bell was smelted down to be used as weapons for the Bolsheviks. This information, though, came from an unsigned letter, making it almost impossible to confirm if this was the fate of the lost Liberty Bell. The letter reads in part, quote, I saw the bell in Chicago in 1893 and am sure I saw the bell in St. Petersburg, Russia, as late as June of 1905. I've heard that the bell was broken up under the regime of the Bolsheviks during the disintegration of the old Tsarist Empire. To this day, the Colombian Liberty Bell has not been found, and its whereabouts remain a mystery. Number 7. Pepita Madeline Redhair's story begins in the heart of New Mexico. She was born on the 4th of August in 1992, and became part of the Native American Navajo tribe. She grew up in a small town known as Crown Point, located in the Navajo Nation in McKinley County, New Mexico. In 2020, the 27-year-old was working at Hot Topic, the pop culture and music apparel store in Albuquerque. Pepita was also attending the University of New Mexico and had dreams of one day becoming an engineer or teacher. She was known to split her time between living with her mother, Anita King, in Crown Point and living with her boyfriend, Nicholas Kay, in Albuquerque. On the 24th of March, 2020, Anita dropped her daughter off at the 1000 block of Clement Street Southwest, Kay's house. Three days later, she tried to make contact with Pepita, but her calls and text messages went unanswered. Over the next couple of days, she continued her efforts to establish contact with her daughter, but to no avail. Pepita was never seen or heard from again. On the 28th of March, a missing person report was filed with the Albuquerque Police Department, and just two days later, Anita received a text back. It wasn't from her daughter, though, but from a man claiming that someone had sold the phone to him. The authorities were slow to react, failing to classify the case as a disappearance, claiming that she was an adult who was free to travel or vanish of her own accord. 
The investigation into the disappearance was further delayed during the pandemic restriction, which stopped police from conducting in-person interviews with witnesses. On the 19th of April in 2020, Kay ended up filing his own missing person report with the police. According to him, the two had gone out on the evening of the 26th of March, where they would meet another man. Later that same evening, the couple had an argument, which resulted in Pepita leaving the residence on foot. Kay would later reveal that he received a message from Pepita's phone on the 27th of March. The message explained that she was with another man, possibly the same man that the two had met the previous night. After this, though, he never heard from his girlfriend again. Kay maintains his innocence in the disappearance, while friends and relatives believe that he may be the one behind it, since claims of domestic violence marred their relationship. According to one article, Pepita may have been seen on 2nd Street and Freeway in May panhandling, but this sighting remains unconfirmed. Authorities have found no evidence of foul play in the disappearance of Pepita Redhair, and her investigation remains ongoing. The circumstances of the disappearance are unclear, and her case remains unsolved. Pepita has been described as a Native American or Alaskan Native. She has brown hair and brown eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5 foot 1 inches tall and weighed around 140 pounds. Any information about this missing person can be directed to the Albuquerque Police Department at 505-768-2020. Number 6. 33-year-old Aaron Valenti was described as a highly accomplished CEO of a tech company known as Tinker Ventures, which she founded. Tinker Ventures is a website and smartphone app developer. Aaron was responsible for a global team of around 120 employees. She worked before as the director of product development for Overstock.com, where she supervised 260 engineers. Many have pointed out her intelligence, compassion, and great sense of humor. Erin was originally from Fairport, New York, and resided in Salt Lake City, Utah with her husband. In late September of 2019, though, Erin's and her family's lives would take a dark turn. The CEO embarked on a business trip to a three-day workshop in Silicon Valley. It was here that she would explore new technologies. Erin's last Facebook post was on the 25th of September, where she wrote, heading to SF and LA soon, who's around, DM me. She was expected to return to Utah on the 7th of October. That afternoon, she met up with a former colleague on Sand Hill Road. The former colleague later reported that nothing seemed out of the ordinary to her, but something was definitely out of the ordinary. It was right after leaving her friend to head to the airport that the strange phone calls would begin. These phone calls concerned family members who were trying to understand her concerns. She appeared frantic, erratic, and out of character during these calls. At 3.30 p.m., she phoned her parents, stating that she couldn't find her rental car. Eventually, she located the gray Nissan Murano rental and stayed on the phone with her mother and father. And just as they thought that their daughter's behavior couldn't get any odder, she told them the following, saying, quote, It's all a game. It's a thought experiment. We're in the Matrix. This was the last time her parents heard from her, and the colleague was one of the last people to see Aaron alive. She never boarded the flight that evening and failed to show up for a ceremony that took place the following day. Both the woman's husband and her parents filed a missing person report and supplied the police with the model and license plate of the car, as well as the behavior that she exhibited over the phone. The San Jose LE, however, wouldn't file the report until the 10th of October, stating that Aaron was voluntarily missing. Five days later, though, the search for Aaron was called off after she was found in the back seat of her rental car. She was on a residential street in the Almaden neighborhood of San Jose, half a mile away from her last known location. Unfortunately, she was deceased. Authorities found no signs of any physical harm, and the case of her passing was left undetermined for a bit of time. The San Jose Medical Examiner's Office would perform an autopsy, which revealed something even more mysterious. Aaron passed away from natural causes. It was described as a sudden passing in the setting of an acute manic episode, but this didn't fully explain how the 33-year-old came to be in a manic episode in the first place, leaving the woman's case a persisting mystery. Number 5. The Disappearance of Susanna Jane Lamplew 
was recognized as one of the largest missing person cases ever to be mounted. And not one shred of evidence has been unearthed since. The story begins on the last Monday in July of 1986. It was broad daylight with overcast skies in the midst of a working day. It was on a day like this that the unthinkable would happen. Susie Lemplu, a 25-year-old estate agent, vanished into thin air. At 12.40 p.m. on the 28th of July, Susie left the office of Sturgis and Sons on 654 Fulham Road. She had her house keys, car keys, a purse containing 15 pounds and credit cards, leaving her handbag at the office. 10 minutes after leaving Fulham Road, she was spotted waiting outside of an empty property located at 37 Shorolds Road. This house had been on the market for just one week. Sometime around 1 p.m. that day, she was joined by a man that she referred to as Mr. Kipper. A few minutes later, after his arrival, the two were seen walking away from the house. Not long after this, Diana Lamplew, Susie's mother, received a worrying phone call. It was from her daughter's manager, whose words rang alarm bells in Diana's mind. Do you have any idea where your daughter might be? He asked. He explained that the office thought that she may have gone home for lunch, but discovered that she'd actually left the office to show a house to a client and never returned. At 6.45 p.m., the manager reported Susie missing to the local police department. The police search that was mounted was extremely thorough. Search dogs were deployed at Shorolds Roads and the surrounding area of Brompton Cemetery. They then made their way to the missing woman's Putney Flat, located just three miles away from her workplace. But they found nothing out of the ordinary here. There were no signs of a struggle and everything was in order. Police then made use of helicopters, which scanned the surrounding parks and other cemeteries. But still, nothing. At 10 p.m. that evening, a worrying discovery was made. It was Susie's car that was left abandoned on Stevenage Road. It was described as being hastily parked and was blocking off a section of a resident's garage. The car was unlocked and the seat had been adjusted in such a way that police believed that the woman was not the one driving it. Susie's keys were missing, but her purse was left inside the vehicle's glove compartment. Police found no signs of a struggle in or around the car. There were also no fingerprints. The area in which the car was found was just a mile away from the Fulham football ground in Bishop's Park, which stretches north of the Thames River. Divers scoured the river but came up empty-handed again. Further investigation revealed that the estate agency where Susie worked also had Stevenage Road on their books for that day. Authorities soon reached out to the public for any information, and they were flooded with a few accounts from multiple witnesses. According to witnesses, a young woman had been seen arguing with the male. Others state that they'd seen her exiting a property with a client on Shorolds Road around 1 p.m. Some witnesses who'd seen the client came forward to describe the man to a sketch artist. The sketch seemed to resemble a man known as John Cannon, who would later become a suspect in the case after finding out that he was in the area on the day of this disappearance. He also made various morbid jokes about the situation, but a lack of evidence prevented the Crown Prosecution Service from charging him. In 1989, though, he received a life sentence in the unrelated case of 29-year-old Shirley Banks. Another suspect named in the case was Michael Sams, who was convicted of kidnapping Stephanie Slater, another estate agent in Birmingham, but no evidence to support this theory was ever found. Whether or not Mr. Kipper was John Kanan or Michael Sams remains uncertain, and the identity of the elusive Mr. Kipper remains a mystery. He may be the only one who knows where the missing woman is. The Belgravia Police Station can be contacted with information at 020 7321-925. Number four, Julie Early's life was full of ups and downs. She would be diagnosed as a type one diabetic, is nearly blind, and suffers from a painful condition known as adhesive capsulitis, also known as frozen shoulder, that hinders shoulder movement. And due to these conditions, her motion is restricted in both shoulders, causing her to suffer from chronic pain. In 2005, Julie's first marriage ended, leaving her with two special needs sons. In 2012, she was living with Craig Early, her new husband, on Malone Street in Trotwood, Ohio. 
It would be from this residence that Julie would disappear, never to be seen again. It was the 21st of May in 2012 when Craig had gotten into an argument with his stepson. He would later tell his wife that he didn't want her son to visit for Memorial Day weekend. Craig left the house that day at around 3.30 p.m. from a roofing job and returned later that evening. But when he arrived, he found the house empty. There was no sign of Julie there. It was not until nine days later that Craig reported his wife missing to the Trotwood Police Department, which promptly began an investigation. They discovered that the now missing woman had spoken with several people over the phone on the day that she went missing. Each call had occurred before 3.30 p.m., which is when Craig had last seen her. Police interviewed him and questioned him as to why he didn't report the missing woman sooner. He indicated that she would leave and stay at a relative's house following an argument, assuming this is what happened. He only grew concerned when she failed to contact him in the days to follow. Craig also revealed further evidence supporting his claim, pointing out that her curling iron was gone along with her medications and $6,000 in cash. Despite these items being missing from Julie, Craig didn't think she left them on her own accord because many of her personal belongings as well as family photos had been left at the home. The FBI also stepped in on this case, asking the husband to comply with the polygraph test. He refused this on the grounds that he didn't believe that they would produce an accurate result. Further investigation revealed that none of the medications that Julie is dependent on have been refilled since that day. When searching the home for any signs of her, investigators uncovered a few small drops of evidence near the garage door. Crime lab results, though, showed that they were unable to determine the origin of the drops. Police focused on the home and the woods that surrounded it, but no clues as to the woman's whereabouts were found. Three years later, everyone was pointing their fingers at Craig, who had appeared on the Dr. Phil show. He denied all accusations that he had something to do with his wife's disappearance. He would then be faced with an alleged protection order that had been taken out against him by Julie. In this protection order, she claimed that he was dangerous, but Craig didn't believe that she was truly frightened of him. Relatives believed that he did have something to do with the disappearance despite a lack of evidence against him. While maintaining his innocence, Craig has indicated that he believes his wife is still alive and he points his finger at the ex-husband. Any information regarding this missing person can be directed to the Trotwood Police Department at 937-854-3988. Number 3. Tampering with food products that leading food stores sell is recognized as a federal crime. But this has not stopped an elusive secret society or possibly a prankster from doing just that. All across Pennsylvania, eerie notes have been popping up in various sealed food packages. Some have reported finding these cryptic messages in Lucky Charms, Lint Chocolate, Milk Duds, Duncan Hines Cake Mix, and even Tylenol medication. The products that have these messages tucked inside have been bought from multiple stores like Walmart, Target, Trader Joe's, and Lowe's. Occasionally, these notes have been found stuck on tree branches in national parks. As reported by the Philadelphia Inquirer, these notes were dubbed the Skookle Notes by Reddit users who've been investigating the mystery through a subreddit dedicated to it. The messages are littered with random words thrown together. Some of the words refer to international conflicts, hate groups, and the New World Order. They also focus on large companies like BMW, Toyota, and Ford, as well as known members of society such as Elon Musk and Oprah Winfrey. The notes have also been known to include celebrities, news platforms, and much more. These occurrences have drawn the attention of the authorities, local, state, and federal. Investigations have been carried out by crime organizations, as well as the Food and Drug Administration. The identity or identities of those responsible for the notes have remained a mystery. The fact that the products are still sealed when the messages are found brings speculation that they're being inserted during the packaging process prior to making their way to store chains. This mystery has gained notoriety in recent years, but the first mention of them was back in 2015. They surged to fame in 2019 and then again in 2023, and have since remained an enduring enigma, catching the attention of many social media users. An entire subreddit has been dedicated to discussing the cryptic notes. Many posts have appeared in recent days, leading to national concern. 
It soon became obvious to some enthusiasts that the same pattern wasn't being used in every one of the notes. The formatting was different, and according to one Reddit user, the ciphers were tweaked each time, making it all the more challenging to solve. Experts have also weighed in on the case, finding that each note references current world events, conspiracy theories, and controversial subjects. A psychiatrist, Dr. Matt Berger, has taken a look at the ciphers as well. It's noted that he doesn't know who's behind the messages, but he's deciphered the contents in terms of what they say about the author. Dr. Berger drew parallels between the writing of a person suffering from schizophrenia and the letters found in the food packages. Despite being looked over by Dr. Berger and computer experts, the contents of the cryptic notes remain a mystery, and an explanation as to how each letter finds its way into the different food packages remains unnoticed. Number 2. Sia Taylor was born on the 16th of November in 1991 to Kenneth Taylor. In the early months of 2020, Sia's life began to take a turn. It was a favorable turn, initially. She was overcoming addiction issues and was turning her life around. And during this year, she started working at a call center and was living with her on-again, off-again boyfriend. She would occasionally live with a friend in nearby Lakeland in her car or with another man in Plant City, Florida. In early February of that year, the good streak would come to an end. Sia dropped her boyfriend off on Cowart Road in Plant City and left at around 4 p.m. that afternoon, and she indicated that she would be meeting up with a friend in Lakeland. But 7 p.m. rolled around, and a local police officer found something that would spark concern in the community. Located on the 900 block of East Trapnel Road, west of Jap Tucker Road in Plant City, was a black two-door 2000 Toyota Solera. It was Sia's. The vehicle's paint was faded, adding to the eeriness. As the police officer investigated the scene, he soon determined that it had been abandoned, with the engine on and the driver's door ajar. Furthermore, it was sitting across railroad tracks that were no longer in use, just one mile away from her boyfriend's residence. He managed to move the car off of the railroad tracks, but failed to run the plates or notify the owner. There was no one at the scene, though. Sia was nowhere to be found, and she was never heard from again. A few days later, her family filed a missing person report with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office after learning that her car had been found and was still sitting where the officer had parked it. And so, the investigation ensued. Authorities suggested that her vehicle had been left on the tracks some time after she was dropped off by her boyfriend. When evaluating the scene, they discovered Sia's car keys and wallet, which contained her debit card and license. Her cell phone was found on the ground outside of the Toyota. Authorities were led to the missing woman's boyfriend, who was one of the last people to see her, along with his friend and his friend's father. Extensive searches lasted for weeks. The area around the railroad tracks was thoroughly searched, but to no avail. Sia was nowhere to be found. This wasn't the end of the strange disappearance, though. On the 26th of February, a haunting discovery was made near the area where Sia's car was abandoned. The discovery was of her shoes, which sat upon a drainage pipe. Nearby was a light pole on which Sia's missing person poster disturbingly flapped in the wind. It's believed that her shoes were placed there initially, after the vanishing took place. Police found no evidence or motive for foul play in the case, leaving it active and ongoing. A $10,000 reward is being offered for any information leading to Sia's whereabouts. The missing woman was 5 foot 6 inches tall and weighed around 170 pounds. She had brown or red hair and brown eyes. She said to have a few tattoos, including an infinity sign on her chest and a ladybug on her left leg, a rose on her inner forearm, a sun on her right thigh, and two X's on her shoulder. At the time that she was last seen, Sia was wearing a gray, blue, white, and red striped mini dress, tan knee-high boots, and a pink sweater. Any information about this missing person case can be directed to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office at 813-247-8200. Number 1. Douglas Jeffrey Cleves was born and raised in White House Station, New Jersey, which lies just 30 miles west of Newark. He was raised under the tutelage of his two brothers and grew up as a constant companion to his sister, Susan. Doug was described as an outdoorsman who enjoyed any activity that had to do with nature. He dropped out of high school to join the army and became an artilleryman and paratrooper. 
Some time later, he would separate from the military, joining the National Guard instead. Around this time, he would start working a few jobs in Alaska. After spending some time in Swiftwater, Doug relocated to a town called Talkeetna, which was just a couple hours away from Anchorage. Here, he'd begin his journey in manual labor, which included welding and construction. He then met a woman named Charlotte Palmer, whom he married in 1983. Just months later, they welcomed their son Robert into the world. While everything appeared to be running smoothly, the relationship with Charlotte began to deteriorate. And then the first bit of tragedy struck the family. It was the 18th of July in 1985 when Doug was working at Eagle River at a construction site. While unloading steel from a truck, a crane that was lifting the girders mistakenly hit an electric line. The power was shut off, an outage that lasted 20 minutes. When this happened though, Doug and his coworker Thomas were holding on to the girder. So when it came into contact with the power line, both men were struck with electricity. While both men suffered third degree burns, Doug's experience changed his life. The bottom of his legs needed to be amputated. The 25-year-old adapted quickly to his new life as a single father who had to operate without the use of his legs. After just getting out of the hospital, he would move into a new home at 8962 Forest Village Drive, located just off West 88th Avenue. Unfortunately, tragedy would strike the man again. It was the 19th of October in 1985 when the person who took Doug's life came knocking. It was on this day that Susan came to visit along with Doug's girlfriend and friend. His girlfriend was a dancer at the Great Alaskan Bush Company, while his friend who lived nearby often babysat Robert, who wasn't there that day. That evening, the friends were enjoying some dinner and began to settle down. It was after midnight when there were a few loud bangs on the door. Susan looked at the time and it was 12.20 a.m. and gave her brother a quizzical look. She then got up and headed to the door and behind it, there stood an unidentified figure wearing a balaclava, gloves, and a tan trench coat. The person was holding a bolt-action hunting rifle. Susan pushed the door closed as quickly as she could, but the figure managed to insert the barrel between the door and the frame, preventing it from closing. The masked maniac then barreled through the home, knocking Susan back and making his way to Doug. Doug was on the floor, lying on some pillows. His friend and girlfriend were lying near him, and tried to clear out of the way as they screamed, but Doug was helpless and unable to defend himself. One of the women was grazed by the first firing, which missed the victim. One new article claimed that this stray slug had made its way into a wall, almost hitting someone on the other side. Doug began pleading for his life, saying, I understand what's going on, we can work this out, but his cries led to no mercy. These were his last words as the assailant fired another five rounds at the man's body. The masked individual bolted out the door and disappeared into the night. The papers described the intruder as a short and thin person, but witnesses were unable to determine if they were male or female, as reported in a short article. Doug succumbed immediately to his wounds, and his case was left unsolved. To this day, no one knows who the intruder was or why he was firing at Doug in the first place. The investigation is still open and ongoing as the Anchorage police and the victim's family plead for any tips. Any information can be directed to the Anchorage police at 786-8900. Alternatively, tips can be sent to Crime Stoppers at 561-STOP. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.